All right, class, we're in section 12 here uh, in your books. Uh, we are going to start off right here at section 3. And Ishmael asks, what happens to the people who live in the hands of God? And they go back and forth, you know, about it for a while because the narrator answers it backwards. You know, he tries to answer what we do and, and all that stuff. But when you get over to the next page, um, you know, after he says you've turned the question upside down, um, he starts saying, you know, what do they do? What happens to these people? And he goes through a long conversation about, you know, becoming man and evolving and what we do. And basically, uh, again, kind of like the other day, you get some rep repetitious uh, themes. But you have the idea that when we compete with nature, we, uh, you know, we evolve. We, we become stronger, faster, smarter, uh, you know, more agile. And one of the great dangers of taker civilization is that, is that you increasingly take yourself out of nature. For example, you guys may have heard of the fish people of Indonesia. There are these people who have lived on the ocean. Their, their villages are actually on stilts, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, out in the ocean, off the shore of these islands, and they've lived there for years. And their vision, their eyes have evolved to where they can see just as good in the water as they can see out of the water. They also are very adept at holding their breath. You know, the average person can uh, swim far deeper and hold their breath uh, much longer uh, than we can. And you always know that, you know, native peoples are, are always depicted as being tough. You know, there's the age-old tradition in cowboy movies of the Indian calling us, uh, you know, uh, Europeaners, uh, you know, tenderfoot, because, you know, they're, we, we've gotten weaker, you know, from taking ourselves out of nature, wearing shoes. So the idea here is that creation um, is not a fixed point. It is a process. Uh, animals and <coughs> excuse me, all plants, everything are constantly evolving, and that is the process of creation. And and if, and if we live under these laws, then we will evolve as well. Uh, that, you know, maybe we won't have pandemics going around, for example. Um, you know, so we'll get stronger. So it's the idea that we are actually getting weaker by taking ourselves out of the law of competition. Okay. Uh, so essentially, through civilization, we are ending the process of creation itself, which is definitely in defiance of any god that may exist. And we're speeding towards the destruction of everything uh, because we have the opposite promise. You know, the lever promise is that if you follow these rules, Creation goes on forever. The promise of civilization is always, you know, especially through religion, that it's going to come to some kind of end time, you know. And you know, there's a there's a philosophy, uh, you know, term and psychology term called self fulfilling philosophy, where if you tell yourself something enough times, you live in a way that makes it come true, uh, kind of like the way that, that that Hitler and the Nazis made that vision come true. All right. So over here in chapter six, you know, um, there's also lots of neat evidence for this. <coughs> and by evidence, I mean basic logical argument, you know, list of other things that became the way that we became. Um, so one thing he starts talking about in section six is the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, which we've already talked about in the tree of life and wondering, you know, if we'll ever get to the tree of life and what it could be. And he also starts to point out that, you know, the idea that we were never kicked out of the garden, this is just what we've done with it. And he starts talking about self-awareness and intelligence. Okay, so if you have a psychology class, you may have heard of the Roge task, which is where you take a uh, baby around, you know, anywhere from six to months to a year, uh, the, and the idea is that you can pinpoint when they become aware of self, when they know I'm an individual, I am me, when they're capable of having that level of thought. And so what you do is you acclimate the child to a mirror for a couple weeks so that it's used to its reflection. And then you put a red lipstick on its cheek in a place where it can't see it with its eyes. 
but can see it in the mirror. And if that child reaches to its own face to touch the red schmear, then it knows that that red is on my face. I'm an individual. So what's interesting is there are many species of animal on this planet that has that level of self-awareness, you know. <clears throat> Dolphins, whales, a lot of those, uh, you know, ocean, mammalia, um, you know, uh, octopus, octopus probably do. I don't know if it's ever been tested. But a lot of your primates do as well. And so if these creatures, uh, you know, are attaining the idea of self, he starts acting, you know, look, whoa, he starts asking this question, what if our role is that we're supposed to be the leaders for the rest of the world? What if we were the ones who are supposed to reach this point of evolution and then we're supposed to lead by design because, I, by you know, lead because we're the first ones to the rest of the species? <clears throat> he's making a very good point here. The point that he's making is, you can't get rid of the story of civilization, this flawed thing that we've been doing, without replacing it with another stronger, better story. So, you know, if you think about, like, if you're a believer and you think about this in religious terms, if some of other gods' creations are starting to, you know, gain intelligence and talk and <coughs> communicate and gain self-awareness, then shouldn't you lead them into the fold? Shouldn't you be a leader for them? Tell them how to live, you know? usher them into the faith. And, uh, you know, you may be laughing at this, but keep in mind, you know, we had a silverback gorilla, you know, in Atlanta that could sign language, uh, you know, full sentences. You know, there you would be surprised how intelligent, uh, you know, animals are. I mean, we trained, you know, dolphins to set bombs on ships and disarm bombs and tell us where bombs are. You know, dolphins and elephants are capable of doing, you know, fairly complex math. Um, you know, um, and, you know, and, and they have languages uh, so complex that we can't even understand them. So, you know, what, what if it is that we're supposed to lead these things into this big communal, you know, society that is the world? I mean, think about, you know, the idea of other animals becoming intelligent, us being able to have like conversations in society with them, you know, be like something out of a science fiction novel or a video game be amazing. So basically the point is that if we're going to replace uh, something, then it has to be with something good. We have to come up with a third story of how to live life on this planet that doesn't, you know, destroy everything. And now we know what the rules are. You know, don't <clears throat> destroy your competition. Don't destroy their food. Don't keep them away from food. You know, think about how you treat things, right? And he asks a series of questions, you know, does, does being civilized mean that, that you can destroy the world? And, you know, does being civilized mean that you have to, you know, give up farming and, uh, you know, and, and, and a, a lot of other points like that. And then he also tells us, what do we need to do? Like, what do we need to do to get this across? And here we have it in this section. First, the story of Genesis must be reversed. Uh, we've got to stop destroying levers. They they have knowledge that stretches back, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they know the multiple ways to live. Uh, we've got to quit doing that. We've got to get rid of the idea that there is only one right way to live. We have to spit out the fruit of civilization. We have to come up with another story, another way to live life, one that's more responsible, you know, and what's wrong with being more responsible? And then he says, and also, you know, uh, we, we've, we, we've got to think about how we live our lives. We have to come up with a new paradigm, a new story of how to live life. That's the only way. And you, class, you have to take what you've learned from this book and pass it on. You know, uh, and it starts talking about the way that Christianity spread across the country, you know, I mean, the world without email or all that stuff, you know, and it was done by one person one person teaching 10 others what they've learned and those teaching 10 others and those teaching 10 others. And if we have internet and Facebook and, you know, Snapchat and, you know, crap chat and all that stuff, then, you know, we can spread that information. We, we can, we can take these ideas and use critical thinking and embrace them and think about what happens next. And so the next part of this section is important. He starts talking about is the idea of prison. 
And he starts talking about power structures in prison. Now, if you don't know much about prison, you can get anything you want in prison if you're powerful. I mean, there's, you know, like drugs, like you get like marijuana, but there's like a 500% markup. You can get like heroin. You can get anything you want in prison, TVs, sex, whatever you want, but you have to have the power. And, you know, traditionally, uh, so he makes a comparison to the world with, the, with prison. And he's talking about how, you know, traditionally, you know, white males have had the largest part of power of the world. And, you know, that's changed a lot since this uh, book was uh, written. Uh, but, it's, but it's talking about the idea of how power is distributed. And we tell ourselves that power is distributed equally in society, you know, in America where everything's fair. But the country is, and the whole, every country is like a prison, you know, that, that is, there is not a fair power structure. There's not a pa fair, uh, you know, uh, way to make lots of money. You know, some things are, are built in a way where the wealthy, you know, get a, you know, get better deals and get advantages by laws and things like that. So we know that these things aren't, aren't fair power structures, but we tell ourselves they are anyway. Now in prison, the difference is, that we know that. Now, what's interesting is that he mentions Donald Trump and that Donald Trump is also, you know, uh, just as much as a prisoner of this system as everywhere else. And this is interesting because this was written before, you know, he was president back in 1994. Um, uh, but basically the idea is that even the warden, even the prison guards are essentially captured by the story, by the circumstances that make this prison. And everything that happens in their lives is, is linked to the idea of this prison. And the prison guards and the wardens can't really escape it any more than the prisoners can. It's all an illusion of power. And the metaphor is that essentially, you know, we can't escape this planet. It, it, is, it is our, in a sense, it's our prison. And the takers, you know, we have made this prison civilization. And therefore, it's unavoidable. It's not something we can escape from. So if we don't come up with a new way to live... And that's, you know, the death for everybody in the prison, All right? So that is, uh, you know, that's, that's all about the prison. Uh, there was a couple things back I wanted to mention. Um, you know, he talks about the Soviet Union and the fall, the Berlin Wall and the fall of communism and all that stuff. And basically the point he's making is there can be extreme social change that happens quickly. So it shouldn't be scoffed at. It's possible. All right. Thank you, class.